Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to this special edition of Newsmakers, the best of living here. I'm Fred Martino. Today we take a closer look at artists in our region. Whether they paint, draw, build, or photograph their passion, it's clearly visible in everything they do. We got tired of snow in Colorado and northern New Mexico wasn't quite warm enough so we decided to come farther south. When I came to Las Cruces we drove through miles and miles of desert and then all of a sudden you come to this beautiful farm valley. So uh, I felt very much at home having grown up on a farm and it was just beautiful with the mountains in the background, the Oregon mountains are fantastic, the light in New Mexico is clear and the mountains are sharp and bright and it makes the colors intense. It's just a magical place. I think that being an artist lets you see the world in a different way. You, um, you see things that other people may not notice. You, uh, look for shapes and colors and beauty in places that other people may be too busy to notice. Being an artist is great at for is sharing that with other people to say stop a second, take, you know, stop in your busy life and it, look at how beautiful this is. Look at what's out there. This time of year in the valley is so fantastic with the chili harvest going on and the smell of green chili. There's nothing like green chili roasting. It's the best. For painting, I prefer painting red. For eating, I prefer green on most, but um, on enchiladas, I'll take red. I usually work from dark to light. Um, laying in a lot of the shadows and texture in the shadows, but keeping, letting the shadows stay really glowing and transparent in those areas, not covering everything up with paint. And then after I get that laid in, it, um, it's hard to see when, when it's at this stage, there's so much dark, but eventually more and more light will be built on top of it. I use a few brushes in some parts, but almost all of my painting is done with a palette knife. So what that does is let me get a big, thick part of paint and drop it onto the canvas. And it also has some of that um, watercolor effect of what they call happy accidents, where things will blend in different ways or mix next to each other that are kind of um, a surprise. It, you know, it just is something that happens. It's really exciting. And I like to leave some things up to people's imagination. You know, I'll put little marks in there. There are hints of chilies, but I don't want to make every individual chili and have somebody um, have it all done for them. I want the viewer to have a chance to go in and say, oh, discover things. So, you know, oh, I didn't see that before. There's something hidden in there. We go to the grocery store and get our food and don't even think about where it comes from. So um, this is a way for me to honor that work. I've always loved painting people. 
I generally don't paint the faces on, on the chili field workers, and there are a few reasons for that. To most of us, they are faceless. They're um, out there working, and, and we almost don't see them part of the time. People who have had their families working in the fields really connect. They'll say, wow, that looks just like my grandfather, or that looks like my mom. And if I, if I put a portrait face on, then that connection can be lost. So I think it's kind of neat that, that they like that, they see that I'm trying to honor the, the people working there, and, and it reminds them of something in their heritage. The last uh, few years, I've been able to paint full-time, plus a little extra, you know, with, uh, I usually, I think I probably put 50 hours a week into painting and painting related activities. And it's just such a great way to spend the day. I come in here and I'll put on music or sometimes I'll put on a show. I watch a lot of PBS and uh, turn that on and, and paint and just uh, lose myself. The time just flies by. My website is jerrysstudio.com. It's J-E-R-I-S-S-T-U-D-I-O.com. I'm working on each painting. At that time, it's my favorite, but um, I love sharing them with people. I love seeing it go to somebody who really loves the color and, and the subject and um, can enjoy it because I want to go on and do the next one. I got into metalsmithing when I went to Indiana University. I was planning on being an art teacher and uh, ended up not being able to get any other studio classes except for jewelry. And so I took my first jewelry class and ended up had, getting 13 hours of jewelry design and silversmithing. And my teacher was a fairly famous metalsmith who had studied in Sweden. We did a lot of abstract work, and that's the basic, the first things I did were more abstract than the pieces that I do now. See the flash when it solders, which I just did, changes color. I have to do this one really slowly, warm it up slowly. The, um, these are the posts that I'm soldering on the back of the earring, and if I put the heat on it too fast, that post will fall over. Now I'm gonna quench them. So I just quench them in this, it's called a pickle. Um, that helps clean them off. I'll leave them in there for a little while and then I'll polish them. You can see it went, that's why it's called quenching. I use mostly fairly simple processes, but I, uh, I love stones because they remind me of the landscape, especially here in New Mexico where you have all the, the, the wonderful colors and patterns in the stones. And a lot of the stones that I um, use in my work um, remind me of that landscape. I first saw petroglyphs in 1986 and I was really intrigued by them as an artist in the archeologic or anthropologic way. They were just beautiful. As I used them over a period of time, I became more and more interested in them, and so I wanted to know how old they were, and I wanted to help to protect them. One of the ways to help to protect them is to document the sites. I took that on as a volunteer thing. I'm able to do that for the BLM here in southern New Mexico. I go out to the sites, um, which is a real treat. The field work is always a lot of fun. 
It helps go out many times because you see things in different ways. Uh, one of the things that I do that in that is that I do tracing. So I take a photograph and I trace it so it's easier to see because sometimes you can't see it very well on the rock. The process that I use is kind of complicated and it's not linear, but I can explain it in a linear way, is that I see something that inspires me, especially the petroglyph images, which a lot of my pieces are based on. I'll take pictures and I'll come home, print the pictures, and, and I'll trace out an idea. So I actually take my design, make a paper copy, and glue that onto the silver, and then cut it out. I do a lot of just pierced and sawed work, so I cut out the design, um, and then you polish it, you put a stone in it. I'm cutting out this piece. What I do, this is a jeweler saw through the hole. I've already drilled holes in here. Um, then you tighten it up. This is one of the first processes you learn. Is if you're working on metal, you learn to saw. In some ways, it seems laborious, but for me, it's very relaxing. Once I'm done cutting it out for the first time, then I will take off the paper pattern and look at it again. So I'll keep that up with each one of these little bare toes until I have a key piece, and then I will cut it out like this, and it'll be a very simple earring. The best place to find me is on my Sanity Silversmithing Facebook page because that's where I put my new work. I think you have to find your own voice. You have to work very hard. You have to wear every hat there is. I don't think it's as easy as a lot of people, you know, would imagine to be an artist. I think you have to you have to be fluid. But you also, at the same time, have to follow your heart. If your heart's not in it, um, it just doesn't work. I became interested in photography when I was about 14 years old. My mom is a really good photographer. And uh, anyway, I'd follow her around and she would teach me about photography. And then my mom and dad bought me a Nikon camera, Nikon FM, when I was probably 14, 15 years old. And uh, ever since then, I've loved it. It's just amazing being out here with my wife and, and of course with some of my best friends um, when I'm out here shooting and then when the light hits and it's just right there's nothing like it. Not only do we have all this beauty that surrounds us not just here but the Doniana Mountains, the Los Uvas Mountains there's so much to shoot here if you're if you're a landscape photographer but everything is very close you don't have to drive hours and hours to get anywhere you can look up at the clouds and, and see what's going on and think, wow, it looks like it might be good light in an hour. And you can get to a spot and get to a place like this in a very short time. Listen to that. You have one pack of coyotes here, another pack over here. It's just a great place to be a photographer. The photo of Morning the Dead Kiki and I were hiking up, up in the organs, and uh, we just came across this deer skull. And I thought, wow, that'd be amazing to have that in a photograph. It looked like it was gonna be a great sunrise, the way the weather forecast was looking. 
I found the deer skull probably a mile from where I took the photograph. Uh, set the deer skull down and just waited and I actually got some night shots. It was probably four in the morning, hiked in, but then the sunrise was just incredible. And uh, it actually turned the deer skull this orange color, you know, it was just really beautiful. And then having the organs in the background. So yeah, that's one of my favorite shots. My dog's name is Giggsy. He's with me a lot. Um, there are certain times I don't take him if we're going to an area where it's really high brush and uh, can't see the snakes. I don't want him to get bit by a rattlesnake, but because uh, we do, we see a lot of rattlesnakes out here, um, especially at night in the summertime. But honestly, the rattlesnakes, they don't bother me. It's the, the ants. At night, you can't see the ground. And I don't know how many times I've set my tripod up in an ant bed. <laughs> Ants crawling up my pants, and you don't know it till you start getting bit. And uh, anyway, that's always a lot of fun. <laughs> the desert's a whole nother place at night. You know, it's just, it's just you, the wildlife, the stars. It's a magical place, it really is. We do a lot of shooting in, uh, in the Sierra de las Uvas. There's a, a peak there, Massacre Peak. Just a absolutely beautiful place to shoot. There's a lot of Indian petroglyphs around the area. The night skies are incredible. There's no light pollution from, from city lights around. We camp out there a lot in the summertime. It's just a, it's a wonderful place to be and honestly you never see a soul there. It's kind of a hidden gem. And that's, uh, that's west of Las Cruces, about 30 miles. My philosophy in photography, the way I try to shoot, is I try to make my final image look like it did when I was out there, the way I experienced the landscape. That's what I try to do with my photography. When somebody says, wow, I could tell that image was yours before they even knew I took it, that really makes me feel good. Uh, it, it lets me know that I do have my own style. I grew up uh, traveling, moving around the Pacific Northwest and Alaska and Latin, Latin America as an adult. And all along, I was always interested in art. And I finally got serious about it when my husband went to Korea and I would, was able to go to UTEP and finish up a bachelor's degree in art. And then I finished a master's over at New Mexico State University. One of my most important influences was the work of Georgia O'Keeffe. She had flowing lines and really graceful shapes. And this is an example of a piece of plaster of Paris I carved for a basic design class. I started with the jewelry uh, when I was taking courses for my bachelor's degree at UTEP. So that led me directly into the jewelry metal arts when I was at New Mexico State University later. During the time that I started with the cutters to do jewelry design, I did not consider myself a painter at all, but I did do very realistic little watercolors to show clients how their designs would look. This piece incorporates a little clay figure from Central America, 24 karat gold that I fashioned for it here, Bisbee turquoise, and an old turquoise necklace that I found over at the Cutters. Well, I do continue doing the jewelry designs to this day, but in 1990, I wanted to expand, and I took some workshops. I took the Russian Alexander Titovets' workshop, and all of a sudden, I realized I was going to paint, and I was more surprised than anybody. I painted mainly in oils for a while. Dripping Springs, Majestic Ridge are examples of that. 
And then I tried watercolors, and I liked both of them. Skylight, Sea to Shining Sea are examples of the watercolors. About five years ago, I discovered outer space, and I just loved the thin layers and did Cat's Eye Nebula, Coma Collection, but those even related to underwater because I did jellyfish then, and Jeweled Elegance is an example of that, or Secret World 1 and 2. Besides the Cutter Gallery, uh, people can contact me and see my work at my website, which is jo-ansmithart.com. Well, this is an example of it's never too late to try something new because I was very settled into watercolors, acrylics, and oils, and then I discovered alcohol ink. I particularly like doing old trees and our mountains. They lend themselves to alcohol ink, and there are many, many layers. It's very interesting to work with. I find that I like it to be wild and loose and then I like to go in with a pen and tighten up certain areas. This is the way they look when I first start out. I've floated them in alcohol and they've moved around and the red one is in about mid-stage. The blue one is at a very early stage, but that's what goes into ending up with something in alcohol ink. Well, I would say find be searching all your life for what really works for you and consider it something that you can do all of your life. But most important that it's something that gives you pleasure when you're doing it and learn to do it as well as you can. Forever. <laughs> Forever. <laughs>
My favorite photographs are, it would be really uh, difficult to say. They're somewhat like your children, you, uh, especially in my landscape work because, again, I really try to be mindful and contemplate uh, why I want to take the scene to start with and what the scene is actually giving back to me. Probably my favorite place uh, and my favorite photographs are my, is my work and portfolio from Yellowstone National Park. And uh, one reason that that is, is I, I usually go in the winter when the interior of the park is closed. So there are, is very few tourists or travelers out there at that time. And you can really uh, get a feeling for the, the uh, challenges and difficulties of the wildlife and just the, the stark beauty of the park is just, uh, to me, the, the most fabulous place that I've ever photographed. My work is uh, online at my website, zone8.com. By living here, you experience so much, uh, to me, freedom, uh, the vastness, the creative atmosphere, the, the uh, melding of cultures that have all evolved into making New Mexico what it is, uh, which I feel is very diverse. Uh, creative, open to change, open to art, open to, uh, to new ideas. Thanks for joining us for the best of living here. This program is only possible because of our producers, Joe Widmer, Ralph Escandone, and Christian Valle. Subscribe to KRWG News on YouTube so you never miss a segment. And if you have an idea for the team, send us an email. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu.